The address is number 28, Rue de la Fontaine, Auteuil. Then there is no mistake. He who disguises his essential poverty of spirit behind the unflinching mask of law. Sorry? He who, along with the banker Baron Danglar, awakes to experience the wrath and divinely inspired justice. Is that our courage, Gerard? Of the Count of Monte Cristo. Permit me to open the door for you, madame. Monsieur? Oh, too kind, too kind. Perhaps you should go on your own tonight, my dear. I... Oh, my own. Well, I have papers. Papers? For the court tomorrow. Get in the carriage, Gerard. I beg your pardon. If you think that I am going to miss an opportunity to dine with the Count of Monte Cristo, then you are very gravely mistaken, monsieur. But... But what? You think today has been easy for me? Valentine in tears in her room, Edouard distressed and listless, the lawyers arrive. I know that today has been challenging. Challenging? Is that what you call it? Challenging? Your father intends to disinherit your daughter, ruin her. Please, Eloise. Because I can think of a number of names for it, and challenging is not one of them. Must we really make a scene oh, on the street? It's quite at an end. It's not as if your father will ever instruct those wretched lawyers of his to disinherit Valentine and pass his estate on to our Edouard instead. Oh, no. Your son barely warrants a passing thought, does he? And why has the obscenely wealthy General Noitier decided to do all this? Eloise, please. Why has he decided to ruin your daughter's one, her only, in fact, chance of social advancement? Not her only. Because of some idiotic political argument he had with the more than respectable France Depigny's father 25 years ago. Well, no, Gerard, no. We are going to the Count of Monte Cristo, and we are going to attempt to have a pleasant evening, because I do not think my poor nerves can take much more of a battering now. Please get in the garage and let us be on our way. And as he reluctantly joins his wife, Eloise, in the Count's carriage, and as Jacopo cracks the whip and the wheels clackle across the cobbles, the Crown Prosecutor of Paris looks up at the attic window of his father's room upon which the dying sun now savagely reflects itself on this bright and unseasonably warm evening in early June. Are we to sit in silence all the way, Don Law? While in another coach, perched on the edge of their exquisitely upholstered seats, the Donglar, Hermine and her husband, the Baron himself, who sits at this moment with his fist at his chin as he stares without seeing at all the bright and lively boulevards they pass on their way. A false war. To Auteuil. I've never heard of anyone falsifying a war. What are you talking about, Donglar? This fabricated war with Spain. Oh, it's nothing to get so agitated about. Is it not? Certain gentlemen have lost fortunes buying war bonds today. Fortunes. What, certain? Oh, no. Oh, no, what? How much have we lost? I'd sooner not discuss it. How much? I said I would sooner not discuss oh, it. for God's sake, Don Glass. Finished. Over. Thank you. Where exactly are we going anyway? To the Count's house at Auteuil. I told you. Yes, but where? The address? Number 28, Rue de la Fontaine. Uh... Rue de la Fontaine? You familiar with it? Of course not. No. But let us observe, most honoured friends, her face as she peers out into the fast approaching night and perceive in the paleness of her cheek and the glimpse of panic in her eye. I am grateful to you, Count, for receiving me at such short notice. Fear. A pleasure to see you again, Monsieur Morel. I come to you with news from Marseille. Marseille? Madame Mercedes de Morcerf sends her compliments, monsieur. Well, they are gratefully received. Is Madame de Morcerf in good health? As well as can be expected after her recent ordeal. Commander de Morcerf's public disgrace and suicide has cost mother and son most dearly. And you, Maximilian? How are you? I am... You are? I am... Well, forgive me. <clears throat> then something is wrong. Madame de Morcerf asked me to give you this. And gently, oh, so very gently, the young officer passes over an exquisitely fashioned 
rows oh. of blood red glass. Madame de Morcerf asked me to deliver this as a token of her appreciation for all that you did for her. Now, with your permission, I will not detain you any longer. I hope you have a most pleasant evening. Anything I can ever do for you, Maximilian. Sir. And as the young man retreats across that shadowy garden, the Count is for a moment transported. Oh, it's beautiful, Edmund. To a quiet quayside in Marseille on a glorious summer day. You like it, Mercedes? Twenty-five years before. Where on earth did you find such a wonderful thing? A small shop in Naples. The owner designs them himself. <gasps> when we are in our house, I shall keep it where everyone can see it. Our house? The house you and I will live in oh, together. Oh, that house. <laughs> I'd almost forgotten. With all our children. All our children? How many do we have? Three or four? It depends. On what? The size of our garden. Oh, of course. <laughs> How foolish. Oh, and we will grow old in that garden. We'll be like... Oh, we'll be like two old deers holding hands. The sun setting behind us. Oh... I think that I will love you forever, Edmund. But are you, Mercedes? Are you? Nothing will ever tear us apart, will it? Nothing. Have you a moment, my dear Count? Monsieur Cavalcanti. I, uh, I had a new suit made in honour of tonight's proceedings. See? <sighs> what a lovely rose. As great candles are daintily lit, I see Monsieur Favreau has brought all his tailoring skills to bear as usual. Their shadows suggesting the broken movements of monsters on that exquisitely manicured lawn. Is it to your taste? I prefer my clothes to blend in with their surroundings. Oh, then you do not like it. Are the cuffs perhaps too lively? Uh, the green, too... To green? My opinion of your suit is of no importance. It is Baron Donglas and his wife that you must impress tonight. Ah, uh, yes. Yes, of course. Now, as soon as I have introduced you to the Baron and the Baroness, I would like you to return to Paris. Return to... Am I not to dine with you? Is that understood? Monsieur! Yes, Jacobo. The Crown Prosecutor and Madame de Villefort have arrived. Excellent. And the Donglas are here also. <laughs> I must say, Monsieur Cavalcanti, that is a very lively and stylish suit you're wearing. Do you not like the tailoring, Baron? I didn't say that, my boy. Well, I did not. Not in any way. Oh, then may I salvage some reassurance from your recent utterance? You may. You may indeed, young man. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not going to be able to join you at dinner this evening. Not join us. I must return to Paris on the Count's business. Is it to do with this phony Spanish war? Phony? I'm not sure that I take oh, your meaning. I spoke in haste. <laughs> Please, banish it from your mind, my dear boy. <laughs> ah, dinner is announced and I must away. Away. Oh, oh uh, uh, take my card, uh, Monsieur Cavalcanti. Oh. Uh, Present yourself at the address there tomorrow, and uh, we shall arrange a formal meeting between Mademoiselle Donglas and your good self. Oh. I, I shall live from this moment on only for that moment, Baron. <laughs> what on earth is the matter with you tonight, there is Gerard? There's nothing the matter. Is it Valentine? Yes. Is yes. it she you are still concerned about? Yes, yes it is. And then it's nothing to do with coming to Otoy? Of course not. Not at all. No, why would it be? If only we could talk some sense into that father of yours. Well, General Noitier's mind is not to be changed once made up. As well you know, Eloise. But what's the nature of this political dispute he had with the Depignies anyway? I don't know. You don't know? I thought your father and Depinay were both comrades and allies of Bonaparte. Both gentlemen were politically misguided, yeah. Is this why you're so reluctant to discuss it? Because of your father's ancient political sympathies? Honestly, Gerard. I said I don't know, Eloise. Now, please, can we... Well, what I do know 
For a fact is that Franz Depigny is to meet Valentine tomorrow morning at 11, be she disinherited or no. I think the guests may be gathering And there, again. in our drawing room, the pair of them will be formally engaged to be married. Ladies and gentlemen, the Count politely requests you to take your places at the table. And try a cavalcante as I live and breathe. On a fashionable street corner just off the Champs Elysees, a young man in a peacock green suit strides confidently toward the front door of his new apartment. I could roast. Why I see it. Why wait for tomorrow? Yeah, but Yes, but I... what? Now, let's go inside. As I've little desire to speak my business on a street corner. No matter how select. I trust that the veal is to your satisfaction, Baron Dongler. Ah, mm. oh, the veal is delicious. And these, these quail eggs, divine. Quite divine. But something troubles you. Uh, may I depend on your discretion? At all times. This business with Spain, this war that never was... It proves once again that we cannot depend on the accuracy of the telegraph. Indeed, indeed. We set such store in these technologies, do we not? But only one thing needs to go awry and... Pfft. Now, tell me, what has happened? I'm all but ruined, my dear Count. Black Wednesday, they're calling it. Ruined? I invested heavily in war bonds. Half my fortune. Gone. Like that. Heavens. Who in their right mind would maliciously start a rumour that we were on the verge of hostilities with a neighbouring power? Who indeed? Such a person would have to be criminally perverse. Of course, as soon as Andrea is married to your daughter... Who? You, uh, Eugenie. Eugenie. You shall receive double that sum as a mark of the trust and good faith that exists between our two families. Double. I hope young Andrea Cavalcanti has made a favorable impression this evening. Oh, rarely has a young man made one finer count. You didn't think his suit too loud? No, I, I thought the green sublime and in the best possible taste. I'm even thinking of instructing my tailor to make one exactly the same for me. Then it might be said that you and young Andrea were as peas in a pod. Huh? What are you two gentlemen whispering about up uh, there? Nothing of any import, Madame de Villefort. Mm. I trust that you are enjoying your meal. It's divine. Mm. It's just divine. Mm. Isn't it divine, Gerard? It's, yes, it's very uh, uh, tasty. And is everything to your satisfaction, Baroness Dongla? Mm. Sorry? Oh. The meal. Oh, it's lovely. Exquisite. Sorry. Um, sorry. And with the most surreptitious of glances across the table, de Villefort considers the still ravishing Hermine Danglars, who is at this very moment staring, and staring somewhat disconsolately into her saffron-infused bisque. Mm. Now, do tell, Count. A tell what, Madame de Villefort? That story you told me. The lovers in the garden. It was here that they met, wasn't it? In this very garden. <coughs> Are you all right, Monsieur de Villefort? Yes, it's, uh, sorry, it's nothing. <coughs> it's really nothing. Uh, are you sure? <coughs> uh, fetch Monsieur de Villefort some water. <coughs> water. Oh. Excuse me. If it's money you want, Cadros. Of course I... it's money I want. Why else would I be here in these very, very nice apartments, Andrea? Fair play to you. How much? Well, given your present circumstances, shall we say a thousand a month? <laughs> After all, I only want enough to wet me beak. Thousand francs? To start with, yes. Although I do get awful thirsty. The Count of Monte Cristo will... will find out. Well, not if you don't tell him, he won't. And you won't tell him. Because we share the same thought, you and I. I see it in those papers of yours, clear as the Virgin's lonely tears. Now, Andrea, you tell your Uncle Cadrus everything. <laughs>